I was, uh, I was to I w I've always been told that uh, any serious introduction to political philosophy has to start with a big piece of Plato, right? So we've, we've made some effort to do that. Uh, but now also we have to move on. So we move to Plato's son, his adopted son in a manner of speaking, a Aristotle. Uh, there's a story about the life of Aristotle. Uh, it goes something like this. Aristotle was born. He spent his life thinking. And then he died. Uh, there's obviously more to his life than that. Uh, but to some degree, this captures some of the way in which Aristotle has been perceived over the centuries. That is to say, the ultimate philosopher. Uh, Aristotle was born in the year 384, uh, 15 years after uh, the trial of Socrates. He was born in the northern part of Greece in a city called Stagyro, which is part of what is now called Macedonia. It was called that then. And when he was about your age, when he was 17 or thereabouts, maybe slightly younger than many of you, uh, he was sent by his father to do what you are doing. He was sent by his father to go to college. Uh, he was sent to Athens to study at the academy, the first university spoke about, established by, by Plato. But unlike most of you, Aristotle did not spend four years at the Platonic Academy. He remained attached to it for the next 20 uh, until the death of Plato. And after the death of Plato, uh, perhaps because of the choice of successors to the Academy, Aristotle left Athens uh, first, to re first for Asia Minor and then to return to his home in Macedonia where he had been summoned by King Philip to establish a school for the children uh, of the Macedonian ruling class. And it was here that Aristotle met and taught Philip's son, right? Who, who was Philip's of Macedonia's son? Alexander. You all remember the recent movie of a year or two ago about Troy with Colin Farrell about uh, Alexander. Who played Aristotle in that film? Do you remember? Anthony Hopkins. Anthony Hopkins. Actual, excellent. He was, he was a... Was it Anthony Hopkins? I have in my notes here it was Christopher Plummer. I'll have to check. I'll have to Google that when I go home. But maybe you're, maybe you're right. It, well, I, think, I have a feeling it was Anthony Hopkins. You're right. Whoever, he was an excellent Aristotle, didn't have a large enough part in the film. In any case, Aristotle returned to Athens later on and established a school of his own, uh, a rival to the Platonic Academy that he called the Lyceum. And there is a story that near the end of his life, Aristotle was himself brought up on capital charges, as was Socrates, due to another wave of hostility to philosophy. But rather, unlike Socrates, rather than staying to drink the hemlock, Aristotle left Athens uh, and re was reported to have said he did not wish to see the Athenians sin against philosophy for a second time. I'll go back to that story in a minute because I think it's very revealing about Aristotle. But in any way, this story helps to underscore some, I think, di important differences between Plato and Aristotle. At one level, you might say there is an important difference in style that you will see almost immediately. Unlike his intellectual godfather, Socrates, who wrote nothing but conversed endlessly, and unlike his own teacher, Plato, who wrote imitations of those endless Socratic conversations, Aristotle wrote disciplined and thematic treatises on virtually every topic, from biology to ethics to metaphysics to literary criticism and politics. One can assume safely that Aristotle would have received tenure in any number of departments at Yale, whereas 
Socrates could not have applied to have been a teaching assistant. And these differences conceal others. For Plato, it would seem, the study of politics was always bound up with deeply philosophical and speculative questions, questions of metaphysics, questions of the structure of the cosmos, what is the soul, what is, what is, what is the soul about. Aristotle appears from the beginning to look more like what we would think of as a political scientist. He collected constitutions, 158 of them in all, from throughout the ancient world, and was the first to give some kind of conceptual rigor to the vocabulary of political life. Above all, Aristotle's works like the politics and the Nicomachean ethics were explicitly intended as works of political instruction, political education. They seem to be designed less to recruit philosophers and potential philosophers than to shape and educate citizens and future statesmen. His works seem less theoretical in the sense of constructing abstract models of political life than advice giving in the sense of serving as a sort of civic-minded arbiter of public disputes. Unlike Socrates, who famously in his image in Book 7 of the Republic compared political life to a cave, and unlike the Apology, where Socrates tells his fellow citizens that their lives, because unexamined, are not worth living, Aristotle takes seriously the dignity of the city and showed the way that philosophy might be useful to citizens and statesmen. Yet for all of this, one might say, there is still a profound enigma surrounding Aristotle's political works. To put it simply, one could simply ask, what were the politics of Aristotle's politics? What were Aristotle's own political beliefs? Aristotle lived at the virtual cusp of the uh, world of the autonomous city-state of the Greek polis. Within his own lifetime, <coughs> Aristotle would see Athens, Sparta, and the other great cities of Greece swallowed up uh, by the great Macedonian Empire to the north. What we think of as the golden age of Greece was, was virtually at an end. <coughs> Uh, during the lifetime of Aristotle. Other Greek thinkers of his time, notably a man named Demosthenes, wrote a series of speeches called Philippics, uh, anti-Philip, uh, to the north, to warn his contemporaries about the dangers posed to Athens from uh, the imperial ambitions uh, of Macedon. But Philip's warnings came too late, uh, and again, the autonomous Greek polis that, that Plato and Glaucon, Adiamantus and others would have known came to an end. What did Aristotle think of these changes? What did he think was going on? He is silent. Aristotle's extreme reluctance, his hesitance to speak to the issues of his time are perhaps the result of his foreignness to Athens. He was not an Athenian, and therefore he lacked the protection of Athenian citizenship. At the same time, you might think his reticence, his reluctance to speak in his own voice may have also been a response to the fate of Socrates in the politically <laughs> endangered situation of philosophy. Yet for a man as notoriously secretive and reluctant as Aristotle, his works acquired over the centuries virtual canonical status. <coughs> he became an authority, really one could say the authority, on virtually everything. For Thomas Aquinas, who wrote in the 13th century. 
Aristotle was referred to by Aquinas simply as the philosopher. There was no reason even to say his name. He was simply the philosopher. And for uh, the great Jewish medieval philosopher Moses Maimonides, Aristotle was called by him the master of those who know. <coughs> Think of that, the master of those who know. For centuries, Aristotle's authority seemed to go virtually unchallenged. Right? You with me? Yet, the authority of Aristotle obviously no longer has quite the power that it once did. The attack began not all that long ago, really only as late as the 17th century. And a man who we will read later this semester named Thomas Hobbes was one who led the pack, led the charge. In the 46th chapter of Leviathan, a chapter we will read later, Hobbes wrote, I believe that scarce anything can be more repugnant to government than much of what Aristotle has said in his politics, nor more ignorantly than a great part of his ethics. Think of that. Nothing more repugnant to government than what Hobbes wrote in his, I mean that Aristotle wrote in his politics. Naturally, all thinkers, to some degree, have read Aristotle through their own lenses. Aquinas read Aristotle as a defender of monarchy. And Dante, in his book, De Monarchia, on monarchy, saw Aristotle as giving credence to the idea of a universal monarchy, 